welcome everyone to church this morning. See Tim and Laurel are back. Welcome back. And uh, everyone's very welcome here. So good to see everyone. And uh, Marty's visiting, so it's really good to have him. He's going to help uh, play the guitar. So thanks, Mark. And uh, thanks, Chris, for playing the drums. I'm going to read from Psalm 37. It says, Don't worry about wicked or envy. Oh, sorry, let me start again. Don't worry about the wicked, or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. prosper. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can come into your house today, God, and worship you in spirit and in truth today. And just, uh, that's just our prayer, God, that we would uh, bring honest worship this morning and um, just uh, help us prepare our hearts, Lord, um, to do that. And just in this, in this quiet moment, God, if there's something that we need to get right with you or or uh, anyone else, God, just pray that uh, um, you just lay that on our hearts, that, that we could take care of things, God, that you want um, us to do. And uh, so, Lord, would you be honored in this service now, we pray, and, and uh, bless all those that have come to honor you and uh, fellowship um, with Christian brethren, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, how about, uh, how about that for being thankful. You are redeemed. Okay. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. I wake up till I lay my head. I will 
what he says he will do. And I'd simply say every battle has taught me there's nothing he won't help me through. So why should I dwell on the hardships and struggles when I look just beyond them I see? Ways will end is a great celebration, and deep in my heart I believe that over and over again and again God is faithful, and over and over again and again through it all, that He's made me a To come through a life when it sure looked like I could win. But Jesus is with me, so I'll claim the victory. There was a man who was painting a steeple for a church, and he ran out of paint. He didn't want to go buy more paint, so he went down and he poured some water in his paint, and he went back and finished the project, and it started raining. And all of his paint was washed away, and then he heard an audible, audible voice and it said, repaint, repaint, and do not thin no more. <laughs> That's Daryl's joke from over at the funeral home. So I just thought I'd share with you that this morning. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to read verses 1 to 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 18. If you would stand with me as we read God's word together. First Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 18. We're reading, reading in the New King James Version. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have the right to eat and to drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife? And do we also, the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, or is it only Barnabas and I who have the right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same thing also? For it is written, in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is ox and God, is it ox and God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he who plows should plow in hope. He who threshes in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, it is a great thing if we reap material things. If others are partakers of this right over you, and we not even more. Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the 
altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things, that it should be done to me. For it would be better for me to die than, than anyone should make my boasting void. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. Lord, we pray as we look at these words together, that you will be with us, that we be able to apply some truths to our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. In chapter 8, Paul has just been talking about meat sacrifice to idols, and he's been talking about how certain people, because of their conscience, because they came out of this lifestyle, they were, they were ones that, that if they ate of this meat would, would cause them to stumble. And we read these words, the last words of the chapter 8, it says, Paul is saying this, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. A very bold statement that Paul gives. And, and it really talks about his commitment. And, and then Paul begins in chapter 9, and he starts asking these questions. He asks, he says, am I an apostle? What Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And then he says, do we, later he says, do we have a right to take along a believing wife? Like the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, which is Peter. And he's asking these questions. And, and then he starts going into some standards by, by which uh, the a pastor is to be paid. And he talks about using, using this Old Testament reference, talking about the muscling of an ox while it treads grain. He says, who is God talking about when he says this? Is he talking about an ox? Surely no, he says, and he talks about how important it is that, that, that pastors are looked after financially, and he gives all these examples of someone who has a vineyard that eats, eats from the, the fruit of the vineyard, someone who has flocks to drink the milk from the flocks, and all these examples, and, it's, and, and Paul is saying this, and then he goes on and says, look, I'm not talking about this for me personally. And what is Paul doing? You know what he's doing? You know I have my own little thought on this. Paul understands he is not going to be here for a long time. He's here now, but he, he's, he has gone through so much in his life. He has been beaten and gone through so many things, and he sees what's happening, and he knows that his time on earth is short, and you know what he wants to do? He wants to make sure the Corinthian church continues. He knows full well when another pastor comes there, they're not going to be a tent maker. I am very thankful that we, you know, speaking of tent making, we actually had looked at another church when we were looking at this one, and, I, and, and I'll tell you one of the one of the reasons why we ended up coming here was they, this this church is part of an organization called the Prairie West Extension. This was a church plant when we came, and when we came here, not all of our salary was covered by this church. It was covered by other believers in Saskatchewan who helped to support us. And we've been very well looked after. Lynn and I are so thankful for this church and for our elders and for all those who are part, part of you we, being here. We just love it being here, and we've been looked after very well. And you know what happens? This is what literally happens. This church lives by the principles that was set up by people like Paul. But we're not going to talk about that this morning, though. Although I want to thank you for being your pastor and being here. 
Lynn and I so appreciate being here, and we're thankful that this church is set up in such a way that when we're gone, another pastor will be able to come and be able to be looked after too financially, and it's wonderful. But you know what? What we're going to talk about this morning is commitment. We're going to talk about commitment, and, and we're going to look at four points this morning, and I know our time is gone, but we're going to be a little over time this morning. It's Communion Sunday, we're going to be a little bit over time, but I want to go through this. This is important. The first commitment that Paul had is he was committed sacrificially. He was committed sacrificially. And look at the, the, that verse we just looked at, verse 13. I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Paul was willing what he ate for food, he was willing to change that to not cause another brother to stumble. He was willing to sacrifice for the Lord, for his people. And, and, and look at verse 5. Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do other apostles, the brother of the Lord, and Cephas? There's a lot of speculation about Paul and his life. Was he married at one time? Some believe that his, his wife left. Some believe that she died. He, he, he certainly talks about being celibate, and he certainly talks about serving God in this way, and he did. And he was, and, and just the spirit of it. Look at his commitment. He was willing to sacrifice for the Lord. What he ate and drank. He just said, are we not allowed, do we not have a right to eat and drink? He says this in here. But he was willing to give up whatever for the Lord and for the gospel, including having a wife. I've met some wonderful people who serve the Lord as, 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 as a single person. They do incredible works for God. And that's what Paul was willing to do. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to sacrifice? for the gospel. I mentioned with the children, I, 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 uh, I met a man in the early 1990s, Lynn and I both met him, his name's Bill Wilson. He's one of the most remarkable men I've ever met in my life. He's an absolute modern day Apostle Paul. I, I've rarely ever seen someone willing to sacrifice the way this man did. I'll tell you a little bit of story. He was 12 years old he was left on a street corner in New York. He was there for three days. His mom told him, you stay here. Three days, cars went by. People went by. And on the third day, this man parked a truck, crossed the street, walked over, and, 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 and said, Bill, he didn't know his name, of course, at that point, he says, are you okay? He asked this question, are you okay? Within five hours, he made arrangements for his wife to come. This, this man's son was dying of leukemia. Modern day story of the Good Samaritan. He did not need to stop because he had so much going on in his life, but he did. He stopped, he went over, his wife got some food to him. And, and within five hours, it was arranged for him to go to a camp. He went to this church camp. He went in his van. He went to this church camp. And when he came back from the camp, he ended up living at the church. He describes it as living in the room closet. People in the church brought him food. He had one good meal a day. And he lived there for a while. And Bill ended up starting a ministry in the inner cities. And it's, it's, it's gone around the world. The latest number I heard, 145,000 children each week hear about the Lord through his Sunday school ministry. It's the largest in the world. And they visit these children every week. It's incredible what this man has done. But you know, you know, you know what he was about? Committed to sacrifice. You know, when we met Bill, like, just a different fellow, I'll tell you. He just so committed to the Lord. But, you know, he's willing. I see my wife smiling back there. You know why he lives in the ghettos? 
He says, there's a lot of people that do ghetto ministry and they live in the suburbs and they come there once a week or whatever. He says he's lived there and he lives there because he believes God has called him there and he's committed sacrificially. Point number two this morning, committed financially. Take a look at verse 18. What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge. That I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. Wrap your brain around this. What is Paul saying here? What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may, not, may present the gospel of Christ without charge. This is the reason. When someone came to the Lord under Paul's ministry, he wanted the gospel message to be free of charge. He never, he never, got, he never got paid to do what he did. He was a tent maker. You want to talk about committed financially? Paul was committed financially. And I want to ask you a question this morning. What are you willing to do as a Christian to be committed financially to the gospel? And to God's work. And for many of us, it begins with giving to the Lord's work. We call that in church, we call that tithing. And, and there's people that tithe and give 10% of their work, of their, of their income to the, to the work of the Lord. There's different ways that people do it, but, but giving financially is part of it. But what are you willing to do to be committed financially to the Lord? We'll talk about Bill. And I want to tell you a little bit of, about his story. He, I was watching a video this week, and it was, it was showing him, Bill Wilson, being interviewed by, by this man. And this man asked him this question. How does the Bill Wilson, who works with the kids and lives in the ghetto, how does he relate to the Bill Wilson that goes all over North America to different churches, raising funds for the ministry? And this is how he answered the question. Bill said, you know, you know what? He says, I want to tell you the experience I had. I was having lunch with these pastors. And they were sitting there and they were talking and they were talking about their, 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 their expensive watches and their expensive shoes and their expensive clothes. And he says he got up and he walked out. And he was in the parking lot. And one of the men that was sitting there, and, and Lynn and I got a chance to meet him too. His name is Mark Fontaine. He had a he had a children's children's ministry and a ministry that he did in Calcutta, India, where they ran a hospital and they ran an orphanage. Incredible man of God, and we got to hear him at, at the spiritual emphasis days at the college we were at. But Mark Fontaine went out and he and he talked with Bill. And this is what he said to him. He says, "Bill, I know they don't understand us. They don't understand what it's like." to be around children that are facing the kind of things that we face. And in Calcutta, Mark Montaigne seen things you should never see. Children seen, especially children seen, seen things they should never see. So did Bill and so did all these kids that he works with. But he says you can't hate them because they're God's children. They just have never seen what you've seen. They don't understand it, but they still love the Lord. And besides that, if you walk out and you, you turn your back on them, God will use them and he'll use all these churches that you go around to visit and he'll use them to support your ministry. And he, and he has a global ministry that goes all over the world. And, and he runs this, he runs this, uh, uh, you adopt it, or not adopt, but what do you call it, foster child? Sponsorship. The, and you, you have the picture of, your, of the child on your fridge. And, and they've been able to do things like help a little child Tied to a tree. They've been able to do this, and, and, it, and it literally is financed by churches all over, all over the North America. North, you know what? We, we watched them preach. Lynn and I watched them preach. Wow. See, Bill is so used to talking to his children. And he was like, hey, you guys back there. Hey, you. Yeah, you guys. Close the door and come in and sit down. And Lynn and I were talking on the way home. Who talks to adults like this? 
But you want to know something? You want to talk about a man that's passionate? I listened to another message this, this week of Bill's. And this guy is so passionate to serve the Lord and committed financially that he would get in his... He wants to just hang out with the kids. But, but this is what he would do for the... Because for the, for the, he understands how this works. You've got to go and you've got to raise the support. And he goes to church, to church, to church, and he shares, and he shares what they do, and, and people donate and give. And I was watching him do this one, and they, they have the little little thing there to, to get a child to, to, to foster a child, and it's fantastic. But I, I, again, let me ask you, what are you willing to do to be committed to the Lord financially? What, what does that mean to you? Point number three this morning, he is committed purposefully. He's committed purposefully. What was Paul's purpose? Take a look. Take a look at verse 12. If others are partakers of the right over you are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used the right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. You know, Paul talks about, he, he mentions it, have you seen, have I not seen Jesus Christ? In the first verse, have I not seen Jesus Christ? And in, and in verse 18, when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge. And then he also says in verse 16, woe is me if I do not preach. Paul was so committed to preach. He knew he was called to preach. He knew he was called to preach and to lead people to Christ. You know, and think about how committed he was. We did the sermon the other, the other day talking from Romans chapter 9. Paul literally said, I, he said, I, I say this, I'm not lying. I'm willing to be accursed and to lose my very own soul if these Jewish people would come to know the Lord. He was committed purposefully. He was so committed to the gospel. Paul was so committed. He would do whatever it takes to do God's work. Back to Bill. Do you know he was on that street corner that day? He was picked up. He was taken to that church. He was looked after by church people. He was looked after. He ended up going to, to Bible college for a while. I heard a little bit of this story before he went to Bible college for a while. And you know what? This is what he knew. He knew, he knew, he knew, he knew he needed to start an inner, inner city work. And he started in 1980. Lynn and I got the chance to go there. It was, it was amazing. Like, teachers, teachers from the area come to watch what they do. Because they have a hard time with 30 or 50 kids having them quiet. When you walk in there, you can hear a pin drop. Because if you're, if you're not quiet, you don't get the privilege of staying. And these children are throwing rocks at cars on the, uh, before this thing starts, or, or wherever they live, and, and they come there, and it is unbelievable. But, but you know, you know the, the most, one of the most amazing things about Bill Wilson's story? You know, he still drives a, a bus to this day. He still drives a bus to this day. You know why? And you know what else he does? On Christmas Eve, he goes to that corner where he was picked up and he stays there all night. And then, later on, he went and started to visit on, on Christmas Day. He visited the man that picked him up. And I think he's now passed away, but, but he, he would visit this man. But, but you know why he does that? Do you know why he drives the bus? And do you know why he goes there every Christmas Eve? Because his purpose... God made so very clear to him his purpose. You know what his purpose is? Every time he picks up a child, he says, I sometimes go back and sit in the back of the bus. Because you know who I'm picking up? I'm picking up me. I'm picking up me. 
And you know what? Sometimes the pain that we go through in our life is the very thing that God brings to us purpose. I have watched my wife go through so much pain, but when she holds someone's hand who's suffering, and she, she looks them in the eyes and says, I know what you're feeling. I know what it's like to experience pain. And you know what they know? They know she knows. Because a lot of times, the very ministry God gives us the purpose that we have, it comes from our pain. And this brings us to our final point. Paul was committed completely. He was committed completely. And, and what, what do we mean by that? I'm going to ask you a question this morning before we close here. What are you willing to die for? What are you willing to die for? You know, you can, you can read... In, in Paul's, Paul's uh, uh, one of his letters, you can read about all that he went through. This many times I was, I was beat with rods and I was scourged and I was shipwrecked and all those things. I, I want to, you, you guys know that one. I want to tell you about Bill's. Bill Wilson has been, has survived three plane crashes, three plane crashes and he walked away. He, he's been shot. I watched the video of him just right after he was shot, not long after. They interviewed him on the news, and someone had stuck a, stuck a, a, a revolver in his, in his mouth. They were robbing him. And he knew, he was praying, God help me, and, and they shot it and went out here. He survived that. He survived someone throwing a brick in his face, and it hit him in his eye, in that, in that area, and he was blind for three months. He bought the plane ticket. He was going to leave ministry. He was done. He set his alarm so he'd get on the plane at 6 o'clock in the morning. And when the alarm went off, there was blood all over the pillow. He got up and, and he looked in the mirror and you could see it in both eyes. He hadn't been able to see for three months. And you, you, know, you know what this man was? He was committed completely. As is Paul. If you asked Bill, or you ask Paul, what are you willing to die for? I'm willing to die for Jesus and his work. Are we committed? Committed sacrificially, committed financially, committed purposefully, and committed completely. That's praying. Father, we thank you. We thank you for people like Bill Wilson. And we thank you for the Apostle Paul that we read about. And Lord, vision is not taught, it's caught. And so many times, Lord, when we, when we, when we ask ourselves the question, what is my purpose? Sometimes it changes as we get older. Sometimes it comes out of pain. And I pray you speak to each one here and each one that's listening to this message online. I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to have purpose. To help us to be committed to you sacrificially, financially, and be willing to lay down our life for you, Lord, for our families, but also for you and your work. And Lord, maybe you've impressed in our hearts this morning something that we need to change. I pray you'd work in each one of our hearts that we'd be willing to change, to follow you, to serve you. Lord, we pray for a special blessing on each one that will be doing ministry this summer. We think of Angie and, the, and, and, and Gerald and all those who are going to be involved in the BBS. We pray, Lord, that it will be an incredible ministry that many children will hear about you and come to know you, Lord. We pray for each person in this church that will be praying for this ministry that we can reach out to families in this community that do not know you and without you they are lost in eternity not to go to heaven. But Lord, they need you. Work in their hearts. Lord, work in Marty as he do, is doing this, these cases and bless him in, in the ministry he does in trying to, trying to help people to see the truth of what is in the Bible. 
whether there's their judges, whoever they are, Lord, work in them. And Lord, we pray, Father, as we have communion right now, that you be with us and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask our uh, Ken and Brian to come. In the same book we've been looking at, we read in chapter 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ken, would you thank the Lord for his broken body? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your willingness to go to the cross on our behalf. Pay the price that we couldn't pay, the price you did not owe. But you were willing to go to that cross and have yourself beaten and sacrificed on our behalf. Lord, we just pray you help us to be mindful as we take this bread which represents your body that was broken for each of us. In Jesus' name. Take the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Brian, would you thank the Lord for his shed blood? Lord, we come to you with grateful hearts this morning for the sacrifice that you made on the cross for each one of us. We thank you that you were willing to die on the cross, that your blood was shed so that our sins could be washed away. Father, we pray as we partake of this cup that we will be reminded of the great sacrifice that you made for us, and we thank you for it, in Christ's name. Left his glory above 
After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's take the cup together. Father, we thank you. We've talked about commitment this morning, Lord. But we can't even imagine the commitment you have made to us. The extremes you went through to make, make things right so that we could have a relationship with your Father, Lord, it is just mind-boggling. And help us, Lord, to have a, just a little bit of that commitment that you have. And for us, Lord, what does that mean? It means if we would be committed completely, we could, we could, we could, Lord, you can use us. And we want to be used by you. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be committed with our lives, to live our lives, to serve you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. We pray for each person here that as we walk out these doors, you would help us, Lord. To think this week, what is my purpose? And to ask you, Lord, and maybe we need some tweaking in what we need to be doing more, what we need to be doing less, what we need to be thinking more, what we need to be thinking less, what we need to be praying more. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a Bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May give you peace. Amen.